Bless him, bless him, bless him. God, you are so, so good. And Lord, we just cannot thank you enough for the cross. None of us could fathom what you went through on my personal life, on my account. And God, you are so, God, you're, you're, you being good just ain't going to cut it. We can't say that. It's not enough. But Lord, not only are you so good then, but you're so good now. And you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God that never changes. And you were good then, you're good today, you'll be good tomorrow, you'll be good forever and ever. And Lord, one of the good things about you is that you haven't just created this thing and then spun off somewhere to go do it elsewhere. You're here. So, Lord, because your spirit is here with us, we can say afresh that you are good. And, Lord, because your spirit is here, we can also say that we're ready to learn something. We thank you, Lord, for your good word, for your sure word of prophecy. Lord, I thank you for this amazing opportunity where we could come together, your people, family, loved ones. We love each other. We love each other, and we love you. And it's because of your love for us that we could love you back. It's because of your love for us that we could even love each other. So, Lord, everything is because of you. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. And we acknowledge this moment in time, right here, right now, as a gift from you. And we receive that gift right now with open hands and open minds and open hearts we receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I can see your beautiful faces. It's so good to see you all. All right, you ready for your three favorite words? What are they? Open your Bible. What did you say? Oh, I thought you were going to say something about something about pizza. Yes. Then you know you're loved when you got a big old pizza in front of you. He was having a bad day the other day, you know, everybody has a bad day at work once in a while. He was having a bad couple of days at work, just kind of overloaded and, you know, I'm being a good friend and I just said to him, plain and simple, dude, you sound like you need a pizza. So we just went and got some and and he's all better now, right? Haas. Haas. Shameless plug for Haas pizza, really good stuff, next plaza over, right? Anyone else like Haas? Has anyone ever seen their big pizza? What's that thing called? It is massive, but it's got a, it's like the hurricane or something, tornado, twister, earthquake, something. I don't know, but it's massive and it's yummy. So next plaza over in the Publix Plaza, a little joint, man. All the little joints are the best joints. All right, we're getting way off in a rabbit trail here. Open your Bible to first John chapter one. We're here. We're not here to talk about pizza, y'all. We're here to talk about Jesus, right? We're going to get into the word of God. Hey, listen, I just want to tell you something, okay? Every once in a while, you're going to see, like, next week I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but every, every once in a while when you're just, when you made the decision to follow Jesus, the, the end result is going to be awesome. Who, who agrees that the end result is going to be great, right? All right. But, but it's going to be out of this world. But a, a, a lot of times when you're obedient to try to get to that final destination, Jesus shows up along the way and lets you know you're doing the right thing. And he gives you a little blessing right there. We got a blessing here today. And it comes right after the message. So when I'm, when I, listen, just when we get done preaching, don't say, oh, it's the offering time. Time to run. Okay, that's not what we do. <laughs> okay, before we take an offering, we're going to do something else. And then you can run, okay? But don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Okay, so we're going to continue our series called Need to Know. And, and, and so it's a study uh, right through 1 John. And uh, 1 John, of course, was, uh, was uh, one of three smaller books that John wrote. He's the guy who wrote the Gospel of John. And then he also wrote probably is, I don't know if it's more popular than John, because John 3.16 comes out of the Gospel of John. But I don't know, he wrote the book of, you ready? for everyone, All God's people have to say, ooh, you ready? He wrote the book of Revelation. Ooh, right? So... But tucked in the middle of that is these three little short uh, letters, these 
circuit letters. They'd pass them along from church to church. And, and the Apostle John has something to say to us. The Apostle John has something to say. And so this one right here, this is First John, and then creative Second John and Third John. So uh, we're going to study through the entire book. And uh, the reason why we're studying through the entire book is because uh, we need to know, right? So at the end of the book, right towards the end of the, right towards the, end of the letter, John tells us the reason why I wrote this, this letter. And, and he says, uh, I've written these things. So it's at the end of the letter. So that means all the stuff preceding it, right? He wrote this stuff. He goes, I wrote this stuff to you believers, the ones who believe in the name of the Son. Right? If you believe in Jesus, I wrote you these things so that you would know you have everlasting life. And we need to know, right? We need to know because there's, there's, listen, there's an apparent contradiction, but there's never one in the Bible. But it seems as though that there is because the Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Except Jesus comes along and goes, yeah, I'm that Lord. And even though you call me by my, my, my title of Lord, you, you might not get in. It's like, whoa, well, wait a minute now. Something's up there, right? Now, everyone who calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in the one whose Lord says, yeah, just because you do, that doesn't mean everything. And, 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 and you might even be exercising the spiritual you, gift you got when you got saved. Uh, you know, I cast out demons in your name. And I perform miracles in your name. Right? I, like I said last week, I didn't try to perform miracles. I performed miracles in your name. That means he did it. Right? And Jesus is like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Who are you? Right? So we have this one, like, am I, am I in? Am I not? And so certainly we need to know because no doubt two and a half billion people say they're Christians, right? Oh, yeah. So at some point, whether it's at the stage or they're watching something on TV or the, the Holy Ghost shows up in their car or they're up in a deer stand somewhere. Like, I don't know. Everybody gets saved in a different place in a different way but at some point two and a half billion people across this earth said that they were a christian and certainly we can all understand that of two and a half billion people that said it maybe there's some that just it never really happened like they wanted it to happen they thought maybe it happened they went to youth camp and everyone was getting baptized so i'm i don't want to look like a fool i got to get baptized and it's just like this altar call, and everyone started coming, and so I wanted to do it too, but maybe nothing really happened. We know that that's probably the case, right? But we also understand that there are people that actually did have that salvation experience, like a legit thing with the Lord, right? Like the people that John's writing to here, because he says, I'm writing these things to those who believe in the name of the Son of God, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. Right? He's writing this thing to believers. So certainly there are people that came to the altar, if you will, one day, and nothing had really happened. But certainly there's also some people that did get saved. That's who he's writing to. But there's some stuff listed in this book that are common pitfalls that believers, followers of Christ, can fall into and walk out of fellowship. And therefore, it says that the blood of Jesus isn't cleansing their sin. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And so that's why we need to Study this, and listen, I understand way before I start preaching this series that not every Christian agrees with what I'm saying, and that's okay. You know, we're trying to pull off the impossible here at this church, a church that has a basic faith statement that says we believe that the Bible is true, and that with 7 billion people on this earth, not everyone's going to read it, understand it, and practice it the same way, and that that's okay. Right? I'm not here to produce replicas of me. No, 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 no Holly clones are being produced here, right? So our task is to present to you, herald someone else's message, not mine. And you need to do something with this book. I'm only here as a big mouth to announce what it says, right? That's it. And then let the weight of God's word do something to you personally and what you decide. And even in the same house, you might not decide exactly the same. But that's between you and God. And so you have to do something. This Not everybody is going to agree with what I'm teaching. And I understand that there's different denominations and different streams and different networks and different tribes. These are all just modern words for divisions in the church. And 
there's charismatic and there's continuationist and reformed and Arminian and all these different things and it doesn't make any difference. What we're trying to do here in our church is pull off what seems to be the impossible and I'll only say that it seems to be impossible because of our massive human arrogance that walks into a room and says, they need to believe everything I do or I'm out of here. Paul was sucked up to the third heaven, were you? And he doesn't even understand the thoughts of God. How can a finite mind that is trapped in space and time ever fully understand the only one who is not? Right? And so we're trying to just build a community that says this. I bent my knee to Jesus, and he's my Lord and Savior. And so did you, and so did you, and so did you. But we don't believe all the same things, but you're my sister, and I love you. So we can hang out in the same room, because that's real love. Right? That's real love. So that's what we're trying to do here, but I understand that not everybody is that way. And I'm not saying that everyone is right, because there is a right and a wrong. And I don't know. Ex I'm not the oracle. I'm not the guy. Jesus is the guy. Ask him. Right? The book is perfect. But we all understand it just a little bit wrong. <laughs> can we all just be a little bit humble there, right? We all understand it's a little bit wrong. And so can we just be open with the fact that I'm wrong about something? Is, this, is that okay? Is it, is it okay to just say, you know what, Kathy, you just might not be right about everything, but it's okay, right? Can we do that? So that's what we're doing here. And so now listen, I'm not trying to preach some universalism. You know, universalism as in like an all-inclusive, it doesn't, listen, all these denominations and tribes and streams of Christianity, at least, even though they vary, they still derive their, their practice out of this book. Okay, universalism is not that. That's not a Christian thing. That's a different mindset altogether. And that's not what I'm trying to say, that we're not universalists by any means that says everyone's included, it's all okay, pick your own God. That's not what I'm saying. It's got to come from this book and this book. It's a good place for an amen. You ready? And this book, not yet. And this book only. Okay. But, but universal, universalism doesn't come from that, this book. Okay. Universalism is this all-inclusive outlook on religion. Unitarian universalists will just say, hey, you know what? All religions are fine. They're all talking really to the same God. You know, you know, you understand that Jehovah and Allah are just kind of the same, but we just call them something different, you know what I mean, right? That's what they'll say. And so it's like a, a religious buffet, you know. I, you know what? I, I really like that whole uh, Buddhist thing. Obviously, I do. And, yeah, you laughed a little bit too hard there, okay? Just chill out. But and you're doing it again. So... so so, so I like a little bit of the Buddhist, and you know that, I think that Tom Cruise, he must be, he, he's on to something. So maybe just a little bit of this, and, and let, let's just pepper in a little Jesus, because he's got the golden rule thing. And he's supposed to be nice to people, so let's just do a little of that. And let's put in a little bit of a karma thing, because we've got to have a little karma. And we just, no matter what it is, it, all roads lead to the same place. And that's universalism. That's Unitarian universalism. That's, let's look at someone next to you, honestly, you're here to encourage one another, and tell them, that's not Christianity. That is not Christianity. Now listen, on top of universalism, right, there's Christian universalism. And I use, let, let me just do this, and let me use the word Christian very, very loosely, almost not holding it at all, okay? And what this means is that God is loving and merciful. Yes, he is, right? You agree? But here's what they believe. They believe that because he's loving and merciful, that ultimately all human souls will be redeemed and reconciled back to him just because he's so kind. Yeah. Now, remember the person you said that's not Christianity to? Turn the other way and tell that person that's not Christianity either. Okay? That's not Christianity either. Listen, but true Christianity, biblical Christianity, real Christianity clearly teaches that God is good, and because of his love and mercy, mercy, he actually offers a privilege, it's a privilege, a privilege to actually be saved to all people. But it's exclusive. This is where people stumble. Boom. They stumble upon the fact that there's only one way. But I think that it's amazing that there is a way, right? 
And so he gives this opportunity to all people on earth, but it's exclusively by accepting Jesus Christ as your one and only Lord and Messiah. Jesus himself said, I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, say no one, no one gets to the Father except through me. Right? That's the way it is. Okay? So clearly... I'm not going to teach that there's some universal salvation available in that sense, but I can preach that there's a universal problem. So let's do this. Let's read 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. You guys there? Does everybody have their eyes on God's Word? Amen. All right. Don't shortchange short yourself here. That's what it says. Now remember, loved ones, this letter is written to you if you're a believer. This is not evangelism here, trying to get someone who's totally lost as a golf ball in high weeds, trying to get him saved. That's not the way it is. If you bent the knee to Jesus and accepted him as Lord and Savior, then he's speaking to you right now. Okay? If we, believers, Christians, followers of Christ, disciples of Jesus, any of those terms would apply, right? If we, Christians, if we, have no, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves, King James would say, deceiving ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, this should be everyone's favorite Bible verse. It, you, should, you should underline it in your Bible if it's not underlined. If it's, not, if it's underlined, highlight it. If it's highlighted, underline it. Circle it. Put stars around it. We need this. This is a daily thing. This is an everyday thing, man. This is the grace of God extended continually beyond the cross for all of your life. Listen, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Okay, so, you know, there's a ton of experts out there, of which I'm not, but there's a bunch of people that claim that they're experts in every field. You just put on TV and YouTube, everyone's got a vlog and a blog and a smog is really what it is all the time, but... They all think they know what they're talking about. So you get these church leaders, and they all tell you how to do your church, right? They don't care about the fact that one day you were in a room, and God showed up and said, hey, boy, I want you to do this. They don't care about that. Let me show you how to do your church. Let me tell you how to do your church. And so they say things very frequently about contextualizing the gospel. Anyone ever hear of that one? Contextualize your gospel. You know, find out the environment that you're in. Know, know, you, listen, know your people. Know what they need, where, where they're at. And listen, you got to be relevant, man. That's a big one in the church. Relevance, right? Relevance. Contextual. Know who it is. Find out the special, specific needs of these people when you preach. Well, certainly I'm not foolish enough to say that there's no diversity in the human race. Cultures are diverse and there's different languages and practices and history and tradition and ethnicity and skin tone and age and sex and all those types of things for sure. But listen, there's one thing I know that we don't need to contextualize. There's one thing I know that we all can say, this is relevant, and it's that the gospel of Jesus Christ is universal in this way. And it's wrapped up in verses like this. Romans 3.10 no one is righteous, not even one. Romans 3.19, it clearly states that the entire world is guilty before God. Romans 3.23, probably a more famous one. You might have heard this one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. James chapter 3, verse 2. We all fail slash stumble, whatever your translation is, we all fail in many ways. So not only do we all do it, but we all do it a ton, right? So, so let's talk about this. Do I need to contextualize this gospel? Isn't this for, this is universal, right? Everyone has a problem. Every single person has a problem, right? There's, let me tell you something. There is, I don't care what anyone thinks, there is no exception to this. 
No exception. Here's the deal. Romans 5.12. Go back to Romans for a second, right? When Adam, you guys all know who Adam is, first two people, Adam and Eve. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. That's the people, right? And the place, like it's the cosmos. It's all of it. Nature's broken too because of us. Everything is broken because of sin. Cancer is not, you don't get cancer because you sinned. You get cancer because of sin. You, 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 you don't get swept away in a tidal wave because you sinned. You, have, you get swept away in a tidal wave because of sin. Do you understand? It's sin that fractured the whole universe, and the universe is moaning and groaning and aching and pains. Like when you have the flu and you, every joint hurts, creation is doing that right now. Going, Did you ever go to a, a, an old age home? Did you ever hear the old folks in there when they're just dying, right? They're in pain, and they go, there's just this low moan. It's, it's nothing to laugh at. It's awful. You walk in, and it's just, it's awful. And that's what the universe is doing right now because we're hurting, because of sin. It says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, to everyone. Do I need to contextualize this gospel? Do I, is it relevant? It's very relevant. And it goes on to say, for everyone sinned. Well, you might say, hey, listen, we got a brand new baby. She's never done anything. That's not true. She's, she's pure. I'm ripping on you now. Don't mind me. She, but you got to hear this. you got to hear the truth. She's pure. She hasn't done anything wrong yet. Yes, she has. Psalm 51.5, listen, it doesn't matter what you think about your kids. I love my kids, you love yours. It doesn't matter what you think about them. What matters is what the Creator says about him. And what the Creator says in Psalm 51.5 is, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. And then for clarity, I was sinful when my mother conceived me. There's no beautiful little baby with a little bonnet on her head in any nursery on the planet that is innocent. None are in. Listen, it doesn't feel good, does it? Does it rub you wrong? Awful. Awful. But do you, you can't deny what it says. Right? You can't deny what it said. And that needs to put fuel into the furnace of your evangelism to tell the world about Jesus. It's no one else's responsibility but the person that you're sitting with, not next to. You. And so, i got to ask you something here. Who's a guilty sinner? It's a universal indictment, isn't it? Every single person. But how great is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this Jesus, right? So, so if you place your faith in Jesus Christ exclusively as both Lord, that means what? Boss. That means he, what he says you do. If you put your and you've put your faith in Jesus as Lord, boss, and Messiah, the one, the deliverer who went and paid for your sin on the cross for you so that you could be forgiven and be put in heaven into God's family. If you believe in him, put your faith in that Jesus, and you mean it, and you live it, then his blood sacrifice cleans you, you're made holy, and you're heaven bound. Amen. Right? So now you're a sinner saved by grace, right? No, you're not. Wrong. Bait. You just took it. No, you're not. You are not a sinner saved by grace. The Bible says that if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Be, the, the old has died. Behold the new man. Someone should be clapping up in here. That's exciting, right? You're not that same person anymore. And so we have to stop identifying ourselves and labeling people, including yourself, with your old tendencies of what you used to do, who you used to be. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You may have been a sinner who is now a saint, but you're not a sinner anymore. We need to stop trying to manage our sin by holding on to it and just trying to beat it down all the time like whack-a-mole because here it comes to get me. That's not the way it works. Let me give you some proper theology so you understand how it works. Do me a favor and go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, and then verse 12 will explain to us the theology of 
this, what I'm talking about, that you're not a sinner saved by grace. Okay, you're, it's different. That's not the way it works. Look in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Look what it says. We know. So now we're talking fact, right? We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. That means put on the cross to die, right? So are you a sinner anymore? I regret the fact that when I first started this church years and years ago, we used to do a thing, because we tried to play, make a play on words to have fun. So we'd have sinner dinners. Big mistake. And everyone thought, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> that's totally wrong. It's an affront to God. It's wrong. What he's done on the cross, you're still the same? What did I do then? Why did I waste my time with you? Do you know what I went through that day? That's not the way it should be handled. He says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Okay? Now look down at verse 12. Now as a result of this, do, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Sin, it says in scripture that sin is, is crouching at the door and its desire is to have you. It's right across, it's right there outside the door every minute of your life and it would have you if you give in to it. It's not that sin ever goes away. And, and sin is ever present. Its temptation is always there. It wants you to take the bait. It will never stop. But a new creation in Christ is considered dead to sin. So then we choose, and we're going to do a series on this coming up right down the pike. You can see it on the horizon. It's coming. You can choose. Someone say, I can choose. I can choose, I can choose not to give in to sin's temptation. You can choose. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You're a saint, and you need to start saying that about yourself. Okay, you need to. You're not a sinner. You're a saint. Psalm 1.5 says this, if you're not sure yet. It says that sinners will be condemned at the judgment and will have no place amongst the godly. So listen, if you're a sinner saved by grace, sinners are going to be condemned at the judgment. You want to be a sinner still? Okay, stop calling yourself that. You're not a sinner. You're a saint. Sinners have no place amongst the godly. In heaven, there'll be Christians only, and there'll be no sinners there. There'll only be saints there. Do you understand? There'll only be saints. If you're saved, then you're not a sinner. This is what you are. You're righteous. You're holy, you're godly, you're a priest of God, you're a son, you're a daughter, you're a co-heir. This is how God describes you. You're not a sinner. Psalm, 50, Psalm 1 is a clear defining line between sinner and saint. The word saint is often misused. You know what we use it for, right? The, the little old lady that's been feeding hungry people for 100 years and the, you know, the people that adopt all these kids from other countries and you're wretched and, and awful because you don't and Francis Chan has 20 of them and oh, he's just a saint. You know, that's just wrong usage of the word. And we elevate these people and we call them a saint. Like, I'm not ripping the Catholic Church, but they call them, you know, like Saint Matthew, Saint Mark, Saint this, Saint that. I'm just here to offer you this, that, that, that um, you're Saint Jerome. Mom may laugh, but you're St. Jerome, and you're St. Haley, you see? <laughs> Her arm's not too long, too short to reach either, like the Lord's, okay? So just be careful there. <clears throat> Saints, that's a different, that, 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 we, we misuse it. The Greek word for saint is hagios, and it means sacred consecrated, holy, you know, like set apart, like you're his now. That's all it is. It's not the one who's perfect. It's not the one who has 27 adopted kids and works, you know, three jobs and because, and runs an orphanage and has a, no, that, that, that's, that's, well, you know, J.C. Penny, he tied 90% and he only lived off of 10. He's just saying, no, 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 that's, that's bad use. It, 
Also, part of the definition, it says uh, sacred, saint, consecrated, holy, and blameless. Blameless, like Colossians, Paul says, you once enemies of God, separated from him because of your evil thoughts and actions, but God has reconciled you back to himself through the, through the sacrifice of Jesus, and he's brought you into his presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. That's awesome, right? But listen, are you really blameless? Let's have some honesty in church, right? Who in here is blameless? Underneath that little umbrella you call Jesus, you're just sinning down there, aren't you? Down here. You got it going on down there. Nobody's blameless. So positionally, out of God's eyes, that's what he chooses. He, see, that's where we get the power to choose, because he chooses. Because like, it's not like he's dumb. He knows what you did today, dude. Right? But he still says, his word, blameless. Right? Blameless. Did you do something wrong today? Probably. Right? But what does God say about you? Is he stupid? No, he chose to say it. It's not that he's dumb. It's not that he's blind. It's not that he's deaf. He chose it. This is what I decided to do. Because Jesus is blameless, because Jesus is perfect, I'm going to just say, yes, that you are. Because you're applying what he did onto you, right? That, that's what He chooses to call you blameless, but you're really, really not. So it's not reserved for the super hyper-Christian that's like, oh, I'm awesome and I'm perfect, and they do everything right. Look, at here's some examples. Oftentimes in the New Testament, the New Testament writers would address who they were writing the letter to, right? They'd say, this is who I am and this is who I'm writing to. Romans chapter 1, okay? So we know that Paul wrote, you don't have to go there, but you can write the reference down 1-7. You know that Paul wrote to the church, to the people there in Rome, right? And so it says, to all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as saints. That's what it says. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 1-2. To God's church. To God's church. Did it say to the elders? Nope. Did it say to the deacons? Nope. How about the deaconesses? Nope. Right? Didn't say anything about that. It said to God's church. That means us, right? To God's church at Corinth. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called as saints. See, that's what God calls you. He calls you a saint, so we need to stop calling ourselves sinners, okay? We need to stop dwelling in the past about who we used to be and then just applying a little bit of Jesus on it. No, 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 no. The, if, the, the real theology is this. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is dead. That person's gone. Now, now listen. When, when, when you get delivered of something, that doesn't mean something can't come back. If someone has been healed of cancer, that's awesome. God did that, right? But does that mean they're never going to get cancer again? No. You might have got cancer in your hand, and then you, he heals it, and then you get it in your lung. But it doesn't mean that you didn't get delivered. See, one of the things that annoys me, and this is, man, with all due respect, if you've had a, an addiction and you found help in, like, AA, I mean, I think it's great that they help people not drink. I mean, that's good. Nothing good ever comes out of drinking. I'm just going to voice of experience, okay? Don't judge me. But I, 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 I know <laughs> nothing good comes out of it. So, so if you go, I don't care what organization you go to. If they can get that bottle out of your hand for a moment, that's awesome news, right? But the thing that frustrates me about organizations like AA is that Hi, I'm Dave. I'm an alcoholic. And I've been sober for 22 years. What? 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 I've been so, you've been sober for 22 years? You're not an alcoholic. How about, how about, I'm Dave, I used to be a raging alcoholic. I used to love doing this, but now I'm not anymore because Jesus healed me of that, and now I don't do that. I used to love it, now I hate it, and I do this instead. How about this is what I used to be, but now this is who I am now. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Listen, Jesus and AA are not the same, dude. They manage sin, Jesus delivers you from it. There's a big difference, and we need to talk that way about ourselves. How long... To, can you call yourself an alcoholic before you start drinking again? 
you dumb dumb, right? Come on, let's just be real. You don't need to sugarcoat it. People don't need to hear the sugarcoat. They need to hear the truth. Whatever you choose to obey, that's the basis of our next series coming. Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. It's not your master and says, hey, you need to drink. No, you go, hey, Budweiser, make me drink. Okay, go drink. Okay. <laughs> that's what we do. Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. A saved person has new tendencies. And so we should be describing ourselves as such. Amen? Amen. So thinking yourself still a sinner, that's a very, very, very low view of being saved. Let's just call that the uh, look at old me gospel. That's what you're doing. Look at what I was, and I'm still, I'm a, I'm a sinner, but I'm, I'm saved, but I'm, no, don't I, that's look at the old me gospel. A very low view. But there's another view that's, a, that's high view, but it's equally wrong. 1 John 1, 8 through 10, which is what we just read, is written to the saved person who thinks somehow they've arrived. You know? That's, the, that's not the look at the old me gospel. That's the look at me gospel. <laughs> look at me. I'm awesome. I don't sin. Look at me. I, I, I. That, they, they seem to think that they arrive. That, 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 listen, there's a guy in the Bible that's the poster child for this. He's the Pharisee. He's found in Luke 18. Why don't you do me a favor? Let's go check out this moron. Luke, Luke, Luke 18. Let's go, guy, look at this guy. He's the pastor of I've Arrived Church. Uh, Luke 18, uh, 10, 10, 11, and 12. Just real, real quick. Let me know when you get there. You're there. You guys are getting quicker. Somebody's been reading their Bible. That's good. All right. Two men went to the temple to pray. That's good, right? That's a shameless plug for Monday nights. Okay. Just want to give it that moment just to sink right in right there. Don't just say anything else. See you there. We'll just see. Why don't we just get everybody here Monday night? Why don't you just all come? You know who's saying yeah? The people who are here every week. Of course Mimi's coming. I can't get her out of here. So Luke 18, 10 through, through 12. So two men walk into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. That was a guy that, like, he knew the Bible big time. And he did all the stuff that it says it's supposed to do. Okay, so that's that guy. And the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself. That'll tell you something right there. Who likes religious people? Raise your hand. Exactly. The religious guy, nobody wants to go near that guy. He's obnoxious. He's rude. He probably smells. <laughs> he smells from legalism. And so the Pharisee stood by himself. But you know why he's standing by himself? It's not because you didn't want to be near him. It's because he didn't want to be near you. Because he thought he was awesome, right? So he, you guys get to stand, stay out there, but he gets his special spot, you know? And so he's standing by himself. Look at me, man. And prayed this prayer. I thank you. So he's like, that's good. That's good. But I thank you, God that I'm not like other people. You've got to be kidding me. Who wants to punch him right now? Just be honest in church. <laughs> Three people, four, five. That was a default. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly... Then he, no, so that, that's a blanket statement. He's like, yeah, I'm not like all of you guys over there. But that's not bad enough. He already made everyone feel like total crap. Then he isolates and goes, but especially Guy. I am certainly not like that tax collector over there. So he talks about how awful these other people are. And then he starts quoting his religious stuff. I fast twice a week. 
and I give you a tenth of my income. Whoopty stinking doo da. Really. Give me a tenth of your income. This guy's the poster child for this misguided assumption of I've arrived. Look at me. I got saved. I have position in my church. I do this and I do that and you do that. And I'm awesome. I fast. I'm, I'm, you're not even supposed to talk about that you're fasting. He's blaring it out, man. How religious is he? You know Paul. You guys all know Paul. He wrote, there's 27 books in the New Testament. He wrote 14 of them. Guy's pretty important, right? Guy, I mean, how many people think that Paul's going to be in heaven? He's already, he already got sucked up to the third heaven, whatever that, what in the world that is, I don't even know, but he got sucked up to the third heaven, and he wrote 14 of the 27 books of the Bible. Yet, in one of his books, he's humble. In, in the book of Galatians, uh, I'm sorry, not Galatians, Philippians chapter 3, he says this, 3, 12 through 14. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. See the humility there? Like this is the Apostle Paul. I mean, this is the guy that Jesus is actually having personal interaction with this guy. It's not, he's not reading it just from a book. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like Jesus showed up and said, why are you persecuting me? Right? Made him go blind. Knocked him on his bum Right? And then use them to write half, like half the New Testament. And he's like, yeah, I haven't even reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection. Right? So he's like, I'm not perfect, but hopefully like progressing towards that, right? So I haven't reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So he does want us to get to perfect. That's why he came after us, Paul's telling us. That's the theology there. But he says, I haven't got there yet. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past. So Paul's not a look at my old self gospel guy, is he? He says, forget the past. And looking forward to what lies ahead. So he's not a look at me gospel either. What is he? He's a look at him gospel. That's what he's saying there. He says, don't look at the past. Don't, he doesn't even reference the now. He says, but I want to look at what lies ahead. What lies ahead? Glory. Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, right? Fix our eyes on Christ. That's how we run the race with endurance. And he says, that's what I do. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ is calling us. I mean, Paul, he has direct revelation from God. And in Romans chapter 7, he literally admits, listen, I love the law of God. I know what it says. I know what God says to do. And I want to do it, but I don't. And I know the things I'm not supposed to do. And I'm constantly doing it. I can't unfriend sin. I can't turn off my notifications on my phone. It's there and it won't go away. And I keep taking the bait. But, he, but this is what he says. He doesn't say, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to dig in. He says, who can save me from this wretched life of sin and death but Jesus Christ the Lord? He sets his eyes on him again because he knows he's not a sinner at all. He's not a sinner for sure, but certainly as a saved man, he and I and you, we still sin. We still sin. And here's the part of 1 John that's really really difficult to stomach. It's written to believers. Okay, it's written to believers, which means that God, who's the ultimate author of this book, God is acknowledging through John that these people who are reading it, including us, they had a legit salvation experience. They had been saved. That's what he says. I'm writing this to you who have been saved. You've been forgiven. You've, 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 def you've defeated evil. You, you've won your battle against evil. That's what it says in 2.13, I think it says. 
I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So there's a legit saved person. And what it says is, to this legit saved person, if you don't admit that you still sin, then you're deceiving yourself. You're not living in the truth. Of course, that means of, that you have unconfessed sin in you. It means that you're unclean. You have wickedness and unrighteousness that still, as you see in the text, needs cleansing. You're calling God a liar. And you're proving that God's word, not just that word, God's word has no place in your heart. And I have to ask you this, loved ones. I don't know what you've been taught. But this is the challenge. Are those descriptions, let's put it this way. How many people, some people think you go to heaven when you die, some people think you sleep, but let's just say at the end of time, when all those that are going to be in heaven, let's just say that we're all there. Okay, we're there, right? We're there. How many of those are going to call God a liar? But he wrote to save people. And how many people that are in heaven can you honestly say that God's word had no place in their heart? None. This is a tough one to swallow. And there's some denominations that would literally toss me right out for heresy. But I'm just, you're reading it, man. You are reading. This is a letter written to a, a group of saved people. And he's saying, if you, but you're, you've been saved. But now, if you claim you don't have any sin going forward, you're calling God a liar. These are not descriptions of people that are in heaven. There's no way. There's no way. And here's another one. And listen, th this is me, this is not you, but you've got to make a decision on this. Why is God telling believers to confess sin so he can forgive it if it's already been forgiven? Yeah. Listen, I love you. Yes, he wants to hear from you. But it says he'll, he'll forgive you. He didn't say I want to hear from you, although he does. He said he'll forgive it. How can he forgive a sin that's already been forgiven? Doesn't make any sense, does it? And how, here's another one too. Your, skin, your sins are like scarlet, says the Lord, but I'll make them as white as snow. But, here again, if cleansing at the initial day of salvation was complete and forever, then how can the believer in 1 John 1, 9 still have wickedness or unrighteousness that needs cleansing. See, that's what we're taught. We're forgiven yesterday's sins, today's, and forever. Like, all of them. If that's the case, why is he telling you to do this? Why is he telling the believer to confess your sin to him so that I can cleanse you of it if it's already been done? And don't tell me it's because God, no insult, I love you. I love you. But don't tell me it's because God wants to hear from you. He can hear from you in a lot of different ways. He doesn't need to forgive a sin he's already forgiven. You know why? Because when he forgives a sin, it's as far as the east is to the west. He can't remember a sin that he's already forgiven. It's gone. So there's no reason to confess a sin that's already been forgiven and you've been washed. Unless you haven't been. I personally, I don't know about you, but I have never... I, I, was brought, I was brought up Jewish. I went to a Southern Baptist church. I love those people. I love the pastor. He led me to the Lord. But I have never, ever, I've never been indoctrinated into any church group, right? So I have never been satisfied with these broad brush, common teaching practices of the Bible that ignores stuff like this. I don't need an easy gospel that tickles ears. I need a saving one. That's what I need. That's what the world needs, a, a gospel that saves them, not that makes them feel convenient, tickle their ears, come to my church, just bow and you're good. No, you're not good. You're a not good. 
takes more than that. And that's why Jesus said that the, that the road is, to life is difficult and very few find it. That's why. You know why it's difficult? Because in this culture of enlightenment thinking where everything is about you, it's difficult because you actually have to do something. And nobody wants to do anything. They want Jesus. Jesus did it all. No, he, he made the way for you. But once you're in the family, he expects something of you. He, this, is your, this is your daughter. You love her. But that doesn't mean when she grows up, she can just do whatever she wants. I got rules, man. I got rules. And so does God. And people don't like to hear that. Let me ask you guys a question. How do you get forgiven so you can be saved? Just, just tell me. What is it? Confess. To who? For what? Tell me. To Jesus. to Jesus. What's that? For my sin. Okay. Confess your sin to Jesus. What else? Just say something. He, Jesus, right? So, so am I accurate in saying that the only way to be forgiven, like the gate, like what Jesus said, it's me, right? That's it. He's like, it's me. You got you to come through me. I died. You got to take what I did as you did. Make sense? Okay. We know that. But here's the gospel that, that's a gospel that's easy. But here's a gospel that's difficult but saves. We know that it's only through Jesus Christ. That's the, that is the gate. You got to say yes to Jesus, right? Now listen, Matthew 6, 14 through 15. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Listen, you cannot get saved by forgiving other people their sins. You know that, right? You guys all know that? You can't be saved and forgiven and saved and headed for glory because you forgave other people. You, you get to go to glory because Jesus forgave you. So what in the world's this saying? Once you say yes to Jesus and he saves you, you're forgiven. But then he's out of his own mouth. He says, but if you don't forgive other people, that you know the forgiveness I gave you? Whoop! It's, there's no other explanation for this. There's no other explanation for this. We know that's not how we get in, so it has to be how we stay in. And I don't know if you want to believe me or not. That's up to you. But you better do something with that text. Don't you dare just rely on what Jesus did on the cross that day for you because that same Jesus said, yeah, that's awesome, but if you don't forgive other people, my Father will not forgive you. You got to do something with it, man. You got to do something with it. We have to get off this broad road that leads to destruction that everyone, everyone's going down there, man. And that's why Jesus said, very few find it. And this, listen, this is not taught in church. This is not taught in church because that means you actually have to do something. I don't want to do everything. I like that Jesus does everything for me. And I like that the pastor does everything for me. He learns for me. <laughs> he changes the toilet paper for me. He makes the coffee for me. And don't worry about it. His wife will watch my kids. That's the, listen, I'm, not, I'm ripping on you, but that's the Christian mentality, <laughs> right? It's not that we want to do something. We want Jesus to do everything for us. Jesus paid it all. Well, we got to do something. So, with all of this teaching that I'm sharing with you tonight, with all of this, and I think it's just strewn throughout the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, but the whole thing, is that true eternal life, true abundant life that the Bible talks about? It's found in the constant, consistent, white-hot pursuit of relationship with Jesus. God, God wants us active. He wants us engaged. He wants us involved. He wants us obedient. He wants us current. He wants us current, not lethargic, not complacent, not lazy, not I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Not even that I have to go to church because the Bible says so. But no, I can't wait to go to church. I can't wait. I can't wait to give. I can't wait to serve. I can't wait to go. That's what he's looking for. Not, his, not someone who, he saves you and then you sit on your fanny and do nothing for him. That's not faith. Faith without works is what? 
dead. Christians sin for sure. We're not marked by sin. It's not who we are. Nor have we arrived. Amen? But we do sin. And that's the third view of salvation. And it's really the, the correct view. A new life tendency is not to sin. But when we do, and we do, we, we, we seek God's grace in a fresh new way. Look, that's the look at him gospel. And that's the correct gospel. Here I am again, God. I did it again, God. Right? You been there with me? There I am, God. I did it again, God. It was wrong, God. Please forgive me. Please clean me. But by faith, I receive your forgiveness now. And listen, don't fall into the trap that a lot of people fall into when they hear something like this that says, oh, so, 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 if I, if I sin and, then, and I don't confess, I get out there and get whacked by a bus, I'm going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. See, before it ever becomes apparent out here with your actions and your words, something happens here first. And the scripture says that we see what we do. But God sees it. He has a prevent, he has a, a um, he's a preview of this stuff, right? Before it happens, he, it says that God sees the heart, right? So, so that's the real question here. So as we finish up, this is where we have to look at ourselves. Come on up, Tom, please. What will God find when he examines your heart? That's the only thing that really matters. What is he going to find when he examines your heart? Listen, currently, now, today, before we start praying, as his eyes go back and forth right now, what will he see? What will he find in your heart as he examines it? Will he find a person who has a heart that desires to obey and to follow him with passion? Will he find a, a heart that desires to be perfect as Jesus is, but fails? But as often as he or she fails is as often as he or she confesses humbly, I repent. I'm sorry, God, that I've done that. Confess my failure, asking for fresh grace and fresh power and fresh cleansing to help us not fail again. I hope that's you. Or will he find in you nothing but a memory of a faith that used to be? Or an obedience of convenience or some religion of I've arrived. I've arrived. What's he going to find when he examines your heart? So, can we turn these down, please? Obviously, there's some work to be done in all of us. So I told you something special is coming, and that's coming in a moment, but while we prepare for that, I would really ask that you would do this. I want to take a step in the right direction. I want all of us to take a step in the right direction towards the Lord, and towards faithful obedience to Him currently. So would you take a moment, or two, or three, or whatever, and I'm just going to try to sense when He's ready to let us move on to the next thing. And just have a conversation with your Lord. And let him examine your heart right now and point out some things. And then we'll move forward.
never want our experiences here at Revolution to be really a lesson about Jesus. If it ends there, it's a failure. What we want is an experience with him. So lowering your head and praying and talking to this unseen God is weird to you. It's probably because you haven't experienced anything in those types of moments yet. So I just want to ask you to exercise your will, even if it feels weird, even if you've never done it before. Scriptures say that we should not come to church to be fed. Not come to church to be served. But we should come to church to encourage one another. Especially now that the time is short. So would you encourage a brother and sister in Christ right now? This way. If you have heard from the living God tonight you've heard his voice to you either through something that we sang something that was taught or you actually heard him speak to you down in your spirit right now when we prayed just lift up your hand right now if you've heard if you've been taught if you've heard from him okay awesome look around everybody look at the hands God is alive he is alive he rose. He is alive. And we get to celebrate that next weekend. And so I want to encourage you, if this is a place where God's voice can be heard, then the people that you know, love, and you want to see them get to know Jesus, they need to be here. My commitment to you, loved ones, they're going to hear the gospel. I'm going to give them the gospel give them an opportunity to change their eternity. And you can be part of that by bring, just bring them here. Amen? Okay. All attention over here. I want you to say hello to Osiris. Okay, so remember I shared with you that on the walk of obedience Jesus shows up and just says doing right and just gives little gifts along the way it's not the ultimate destination but he gives gifts along the way anyone ever experienced that here's our gift so i got here and he said yeah so is there anything you want to say thank you that's okay so osiris was baptized as a baby and he's like, I'm just not sure that really, he told me in the hallway, while you all were coming and we're getting ready, this is, this is the awesome bomb that, that Jesus dropped on us, was this man saying, I, I was baptized as a baby, but that's not really the way it's supposed to be. I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to say yes to Jesus. And so that's what he's here to do. And you know what's awesome? You saw me put this like water heater in here. It's freezing, dudes. 
I had no idea this was happening. But look, this is what obedience to, 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 the, to the Spirit of God, this is what it looks like. When, when God speaks and says, do, you do. It does, listen, and, and then we sent someone to Goodwill to go get him some clothing. Okay? You could have done better. But I'm just saying, uh, no, he does, he looks great. So he's going to be cold, and he didn't have any clothing, but he's saying yes to Jesus. His blessing's coming his way, right? All right, come on. We're going to do this kind of quick because it's cold. So get on in there real quick. Okay, go all the way forward. All the way forward. Sit down, crisscross. Sit down, crisscross. It's going to make it really, really quick for you because I know it's freezing. Osiris, I just want to ask you loud and proud, who is your one and only Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ, and like him, you'll be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. Osiris, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on. Amen. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Awesome. 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 So listen, we got that, and we've got we got Easter coming up. And we got Passover on Good Friday. And we're going to celebrate what Jesus did. Every year of his life, he celebrated the Passover. And so we want to give you guys an authentic Jewish experience, right? And, and so I, I just want to say, uh, let's, let's just do this together. Let's just build this awesome family together, centered on Christ, all about Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what you're investing in. So as we get ready to receive our offering, you know, I, people blindly gave. Will you guys just come on? Yeah, would you guys, whoever, someone, I think Mike's got it. But, you know, in the, in, the, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, you know, the people just came and they just gave their money to the apostles. And they didn't say, hey, how are you going to spend this? And they just gave, right? And so, like, blind giving is so awesome. And it's a blessing in that. But I'm glad you got to see that because what you saw just now is what you're investing in. Like in weeks prior, months prior, years prior, when you gave, you gave so that we could be here so that Osiris could start coming with Kim a couple weeks ago and hear something that resonated with his soul and decided, I got to do this right now. And, and, and you were part of that. You were part of that when you invested. And so... I just want to ask you to take a few moments and ask the Lord how you can invest in this again, moving forward, bigger, greater, more, just seeing God do things. And you can, you're called to partnership with Him. So just take a few moments and talk to Him. Don't just have some predetermined number. Talk to the Lord. Let Him lead you. If we, if we, if we are... It says that if we have the Spirit in us, let Him lead us in all that we do. Right? So let Him lead you even in this.